everybody. Welcome back to QWR Nature News. My name is Renee and with us today we have Kim who will be joining us soon and also our assistant director here, Marisa. So we'll have some special guests today for you all. But if you took a guess, according to uh, Kim's last post, you might have guessed what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about eggs and nests. Now, Lots of different animals lay eggs, lots of different animals make nests, so we're going to kind of do a broad overview of some really cool facts, some interesting nests and examples that we have here, and we're going to talk about them on kind of a wider plane today. Um, but many different animals lay eggs, many different animals make nests. Animals that lay eggs are called oviparous, and there are insects that are oviparous, birds, reptiles, amphibians, even some mammals that are oviparous. And we're going to talk about some from each category. But there are also some really unique animals that actually have eggs within them. So their eggs are kept internally, which is called oviviparous. Really long word, right? <laughs> so we're going to talk about some of those animals today too, like snakes and sharks. So Kim is going to talk a little bit about the benefits of egg laying. Hey everybody! So as Renee was saying, lots of different kinds of animals lay eggs, but you might wonder, well, why do so many of them lay eggs? And it turns out that it's actually really beneficial for some animals to have nests and lay eggs. So if an animal is pregnant, sometimes they have reduced mobility, they can't move around as quickly. So for lots of animals, having a nest and laying their eggs makes it so that they can move around. They can still go hunting for food, they can still forage easily, but there is one downside. Having eggs that aren't inside your body, like a human who has, is pregnant with a baby, you can really protect your baby while it's growing. But with other animals that lay eggs, they aren't able to protect them as well. So often you'll find that nests and eggs, and Renee will talk about this a little bit too later, they'll be predated or they'll be taken and kicked out of their nests. So that's one downside is they aren't able to protect their eggs as well as say a human would be able to. But so we also want to talk about some different kinds of animals that do lay eggs. So we're going to mention reptiles right now. So about 15 to 20 percent of reptiles interestingly actually give birth to live young. So most of them do lay eggs but there are some right here on Long Island like the common garter snake. So these guys are probably one of the most common snakes on Long Island and they actually give birth to live adorable snake babies. And there's another one. Now this is a reptile that is native to Australia. So we do not have them here. This is the yellow bellied three toed skink. Now they are really kind of interesting creatures. They look like a snake and a lizard. They got tiny arms. What's going on here? But these guys actually have the ability to either lay eggs or give birth to live young. So in colder climates or at higher altitudes in Australia, these guys will actually give birth to live young. And that's because when it's cold, eggs need to be really warm in order to hatch. And a cold-blooded reptile has a hard time doing that when it's cold outside. So these guys, when they live at high altitudes, they'll give birth to live babies. But if they live in warmer areas of Australia, they'll actually lay eggs. So it's pretty incredible. One species of animal that can do both. So to end out reptiles, I want to show you one reptile egg. So this is the egg of actually a species that you guys met if you watched our show a few weeks ago about turtles and tortoises. This is an African spurred tortoise egg or a sulcata tortoise. And there's something you should look at when you look at this egg. This does not look like a chicken egg. This egg is super round. It's actually perfectly round. And that's because sulcata tortoises, they lay their eggs on the ground. They dig holes. And when they lay their eggs, they want this egg to roll perfectly down into the bottom so they can cover it back up. And Renee is going to talk a little bit more about egg shape and why that's important. And when we're back and open, you can come see our sulcata tortoises or you can check out our sulcata tortoise episode on YouTube. And now I'm going to pass you guys over to Renee. All right, so another group of animals that lay eggs are fish. So fish there was only 2% of fish that actually have live births, and that includes guppies and sharks. So there are a couple different fish that have some live births, but all other fish will actually lay eggs. 
And when they lay eggs, some of them will just leave them and some of them will actually protect them. So some fish have actually adopted some really unique ways of making sure that their young and their eggs develop and grow and live to become adults. So some fish, what they do is they actually will guard their eggs and they'll protect them really well and they can be very aggressive around their nest. Some fish, what they actually do is they hold their eggs inside of their mouths until they find a suitable place or a good place to lay them. So then they'll deposit them somewhere else. So they'll swim around with them in their mouth until they do that. Kind of strange and unique, right? Some fish eggs are actually toxic to predators like the gar, which is a really cool looking fish. And these fish, their eggs are toxic so predators don't want to eat them. Kind of like what we talked a little bit about toxic butterflies and caterpillars, right? Um, and then there's other fish that lay massive amounts of eggs. So I have some pictures here. This right here, I actually read a really funny thing that this looks, <laughs> this fish kind of looks really funny, right? It looks almost like uh, an animal cracker that was bit in half, right? It looks like half of a fish. This is called a sunfish. Very, very large fish. Sunfish are actually about 5,000 pounds. Huge fish. And what's really cool about these fish is a sunfish can lay 300 million eggs at a time. Isn't that incredible? There's also another fish right here. Some of you might recognize this fish. This is a very cool fish. It has these really bony plates. If I bring it up nice and close, you can see. They have these bony plates like, like scales. And these fish are called sturgeon, and North American sturgeon can actually lay 2.5 million eggs. So when they lay such massive amounts of eggs, they're actually hoping that the predators don't consume all of them, and some of them make it towards um, juveniles and adulthood. So that's a good way to defend them. There are also some really incredible fish like this one right here. This is called a splashing tetra. And splashing tetra, actually what they do is they will jump out of the water and they'll jump to a stick nearby and they'll lay their eggs each time they jump. And they'll, they'll jump and they'll lay their eggs outside. So these eggs are able to actually stay above water. But what they do is they splash them, which is where their name comes from. They splash them with water periodically so that they don't completely dry out. And then when the eggs are ready to hatch, they'll open up and they'll, the young or the fry, which is fish young, will fall then down into the water. And then that hopefully gives them a greater chance of survival, less predators. Because these guys come from the Amazon where there's a lot of predators in the, in the Amazon River, right? So they try to avoid them that way. So these guys, their fish, can, their fish eggs can actually live above water. There are some small minnows and killifish that will lay their eggs in very shallow pools and sometimes those pools will dry up if there's a drought and not a lot of rainfall. So those eggs can actually recognize those times. They can withstand long periods of drought and then not hatch until their pool has been filled back up with rainwater and there's hopefully food available now to them and that's when they'll hatch. So some fish have made very cool adaptations. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm back over <laughs> this table. Um, but also there are some fish like sharks and sharks actually are ovoviviparous, that long word again, where they actually retain the eggs internally. Um, and then they, they develop inside of them and then they hatch out from inside. Isn't that strange? So Kim's gonna talk about our next category. Okay, so I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit strange. I think when most people think about mammals, they think about mammals having babies. You think about humans or elephants or cats or dogs. They give birth to live babies. So an animal, a mammal, most mammals are pregnant and then they have live babies. But there is a strange order of mammal called monotrematas. And these guys, so there are placental mammals, monotrematas, and marsupials. And these monotremes, they actually lay eggs. So Renee mentioned them briefly before. And these guys are really cool and they're super interesting. One of them is the duck-billed platypus. 
when this bird, when this bird, when this platypus, when the platypus was first discovered and its skeleton was shown to a scientist, a Western scientist, he thought it was a joke because these guys look so weird. So the duck-billed platypus, it makes a nest and it lays eggs, but it's a mammal. But there are four other species of monotremida. So, and they're all echidnas. Now these guys, some people don't know what they are. They kind of look like porcupines, but they kind of look like anteaters, and they're kind of both. So echidnas, there are four species that are around still. All of these guys are native to Australia and New Guinea. So these guys actually lay their eggs into a pouch on the front of their body, but they're not marsupials. They're not marsupial, marsupials, they're monotremidas. So these guys lay their eggs into a pouch and then their eggs hatch in there and they feed on their mother's milk for several weeks until they're ready to come out. So these guys are pretty incredible. You should look them up, echidnas. They're also very adorable and their baby, fun fact, is called a puggle and it's really cute. So puggles. But now there is one more type of animal we have to talk about before we get to the big one. So amphibians, of course amphibians lay eggs. Most people know that, but actually there are some of them that do give birth to live young, like a super cool kind of amphibian called a Sicilian. So Sicilians, you should also look them up. There are these strange creatures. They kind of look like snakes. They kind of look like worms. And most of them give birth to live babies. Interestingly enough, some salamanders, we have some native salamanders on Long Island, but they're all egg layers. But some salamanders also give birth to live babies. One of them is the alpine salamander. It's a European species. And they actually are ovoviviparous. Yeah. And their eggs develop inside of their body. And they can remain pregnant with a baby for two to three years, which is incredible. That's longer than the longest mammal, the elephant, which is 22 months. So these salamanders are really cool. But there's one more that I need to mention. An honorable mention goes to a frog. So most frogs are egg layers and only just a few give birth to live babies and we call them froglets. But this guy, so they do lay eggs, but then their mate actually sticks their eggs to the back of the female. Has anybody ever seen this? This is a Surinam sea toad. And if you want to watch something you're never going to forget, you should definitely <laughs> Google it because it is crazy. So these guys, of course, are not native to here. Um, but see, their eggs actually develop and then hatch out of their back. Oof, it's a really, really something you should look up. So the Surinam sea toad. And now, that's it for amphibians. I'm gonna pass you over to Miss Renee, who is going to talk about the big one. <laughs> Birds, right? <laughs> so, of course, when we think of egg layers, we think of birds, right? So, we're going to talk to you. We have some really cool um, different nests and some really cool eggs. So, we're going to talk a little bit in depth about a couple different types of birds. So, to start off, I want to talk about there are actually 700 or more than 700 species of nesting birds in just North America. So, there's a lot of birds that make nests and lay eggs here. And mainly we categorize these guys into two different categories. So we call them either altricial or precocial. So altricial young is actually young that are born needing to be cared for. So very helpless when they're young. So this goes for most songbirds, like the nest we're gonna to talk to you about. So they're born usually without feathers, they're unable to fly, they require their parents to feed them and they rely on them. They sometimes will be blind and, and take a while to open up their eyes. So these are altricial young. Their other category is actually called precocial and precocial are young like ducklings, right? So they're able to be born and they are able to swim at the time they're born or walk from the time they're born. They can forage for their own food. Sometimes the parents will teach them how to forage, but they can forage for their own food and they're relatively independent. So we'll meet one like that today too. But first, we're gonna talk about a group or a type called the house wren. So this is a picture of a house wren. These guys are a very, very small bird. And house wrens build a nest that looks like this. So usually house wrens will build their nest in a nest box or a tree cavity. So a cavity is a hole 
Um, and they, some, a lot of animals use cavities as nests. We call them cavity nesters. So these guys will use a hole in a tree or a nest box. And they're very aggressive when they find a nest spot that they want to use. They actually will um, try to deter other bigger birds, larger birds. They're known to push eggs that maybe have already been in a nest. They'll destroy nests or they'll push eggs from other birds out of the nest because they want that spot. Um, and they're actually the main source of nest failure for our New York State bird, the Eastern Bluebird. So these guys can be a little bit um, uh, of harm, harm to other birds. They do a lot of harm to other birds. But they make these kind of very nest, <laughs> we're losing some materials, very messy nests as you can see. So we couldn't even take this one out of the box. They're very, very nest. Uh, messy nests. They make them, you can see, with lots of sticks and twigs. There is some hay in here, some feathers that they'll line the nest with. You can see um, <clears throat> what they'll do. And but by the time that their eggs are are ready to hatch, there's lots of parasites in these nests. There's lots of mites in these nests very often because they don't spend a lot of time making them very clean and meticulous. Uh, they're not very meticulous about about the way that they arrange these nests. So sometimes these get covered in parasites and they've found a way actually to, to kind of work against that. So what they do is house wrens will actually go and collect egg sacs from spiders and they'll bring them back to their nests. And when the spider eggs hatch, those little baby spiders will then clean up the nest and get rid of any parasites and mites in the nest. Isn't that an incredible way that they've adapted? These guys are really, really cool. So I'll show you them again. The tiny little house wren. And these guys are only about the weight of two quarters. So if you think about them deterring larger birds, it's pretty amazing, right? All right, we're gonna tell you our next bird. Okay. So our next bird is very recognizable. And a lot of people love these birds and they wanna attract them to their yard. This is the Baltimore, AKA the Northern Oriole. So these are really striking, beautiful birds with that bright orange chest. And they actually make a really incredible nest too. So this is the nest of an Oriole. And you can see it's kind of like a hanging, it almost looks like a hat or a sock. And what they do is they actually look for a tree, mostly maple trees or elm trees, and they wanna find a strong forked branch and they'll anchor their nest right in the fork of the branch. So usually you'll find these hanging from branches. Occasionally they put them near a trunk, but almost always they're off on a branch. And so the female is mainly the weaver of the nest and sometimes the male will help her collect materials, but he really doesn't do too much of the work. He kind of just hangs out. So as you can see, they use a lot of stuff that's available to them. And this is something we're gonna talk about a lot as we talk about these nests. They use the materials that are in their environment. So this one is made out of some mosses, but it's a lot of yarn and twine. Um, and then inside of it, we have some grasses and leaves and feathers to cushion things. So these birds are really incredible. They're architects of nature. It's really just beautiful. Um, so that is the nest of an Oriole. They lay about three to seven eggs. Um, so again, once again, and one way to attract these guys to your yard is they love fresh fruit. So people often will cut an orange in half um, and set it out for them. And that's a great way to attract these birds. So that is Baltimore Oriole. All right, so our next bird is called a chimney swift. Here's a picture of a chimney swift. So a chimney swift, like their name suggests, often use man-made structures like chimneys in order to make their nests. And they actually use chimneys to roost in as they make mass migrations as well. So both the male and the female will go out and scout a good spot for a nest. And once they find the nest, they actually will make this special tapping and chirping noise in the area to show that they found a good spot. So when they find a good spot, what they do is they make these small little nests up against, you see this is a, a brick. This is really cool display that we have that we that someone found and donated to us here. And they make it right up against the brick and they use their glue-like saliva. So they have a gland underneath their tongue 
that gives them saliva that's actually just like a glue or a paste and it allows it to adhere to the side of the chimney you can see it right here and they adhere it to the side of the chimney but this is a very small nest so what happens is actually after about two weeks the young that are in this nest are actually too big for it so they outgrow it very quickly and what they then have to do is the young have to cling even before their eyes are open they cling to the side of the chimney and these guys have these tiny little feet that are able to cling in just the little rocks and crevices between the cement between the bricks and they can hold on there so these guys are are called chimney swifts makes sense right they like to use chimneys they'll use other structures similar they do, do like to um they favor lots of man-made structures now um dark structures usually cool structures they like for their for their nesting All right. okay. so the next bird that we're going to talk about also loves to nest on man-made structures and they're named for that this is the barn swallow these are beautiful birds you can see swallows have that signature forked tail so this is the barn swallow and we actually have tons of barn swallow nests on the refuge every year so we get them they like to nest in barns of course but they also like to nest in the eaves of buildings and other places like that sheds things places sort of like that so barn swallows actually make their nests out of lots of mud so what they'll do is they're usually near water, so they'll scoop up mud and bring it in their beaks, and mix it with grass and other materials, and they'll build their nest that way. So they'll find a good location, like under the eaves of the nature center, over the pond, or in our entrance booth, and they'll build the bottom part. So they make kind of a shelf, and then they'll go around and they'll build up the sides. And then finally, when it's completely constructed, they'll fill it with other materials, like you can see here, like grasses there's lots of pine needles in this one and then feathers that will cushion the eggs inside so barn swallows are incredible and um let's see okay perfect now renee is gonna hop in <laughs> all right and so the next animal that i'm going to talk about actually will often use barn swallow nests and then sometimes in between barn swallows will also use their nests so they reuse nests which not a lot of birds do so the bird we're going to talk about is called the Eastern Phoebe. Small little bird, another one. And Eastern Phoebes will make a nest that looks like this. So again, sometimes they'll use a nest like that barn swallow one you saw, and they'll use that one. But you can see this one is made, it does have some mud in there just like the barn swallow nest, but it's made out of lots of grasses. There is a lot of hair in here. I don't know if you can see that in the camera. There's lots of hair in here, and there's even some moss and lichens around the edges. So they use a, a lot of different materials. And kind of like Kim was saying, the Eastern Phoebe has adapted really well. They've actually expanded their range because of human development. So they like to nest under bridges and trellises and they'll use those areas. They like man-made areas now, so they've expanded their range. So the Eastern Phoebe, pretty much solely the female builds the nest. And this is actually, a lot of the birds are like this. But the Eastern Phoebes, as soon as they're done mating, will usually push the male out of the way. They shoo them away. They deter them away. Some of us might feel like this with our husbands right now, right? <laughs> Stuck in the house with all of them. They'll shoo them away out of the nest and they'll care for all the young and lay the eggs and do everything independently. So these guys will care for themselves, basically, and care for their young, just solely the females. Our next bird is the pine warbler. So we have a couple of different warbler nests, um, but these birds, they're beautiful, tiny little birds. And they're actually one of the first warblers we start to see every spring. We've been seeing them at the refuge for a couple of weeks. Um, so these guys are also named for where they like to nest. Pine warblers love to nest in pine trees. So the refuge is a great place for them. So we have a couple of different warbler nests. And I think they really display that these birds use what's in their environment. So a lot of the times they'll use grasses or twigs, horse hair, things like that. Um, and here's 
good one too. So these are small nests and warblers are small birds. So this one's a lot of twigs. You can see pine needles and grass. And what they'll actually do, which is incredible, is they'll find caterpillar silk or spider silk and they'll use that as a tool to bind all these different things together, which I think is just incredible. So these birds are, um, we see lots of warblers at the refuge. Like I said, we're seeing pine warblers now and we're starting to see more and more every day. Um, but really we're gonna see tons of warblers in the coming weeks. So get out your binoculars, guys. <laughs> All right, and the last bird and nest we're gonna talk about right here or right now is this one right here, a very tiny bird. You might recognize it. It's called the ruby-throated hummingbird. Now, a little confusing, the females do not have those iridescent red patches on their chest. So this right here is most likely a female. You can see a very, very tiny, tiny bird. So they make a tiny nest, right? So we have a beautiful nest from this bird. So ruby-throated hummingbirds will actually primarily use deciduous trees, but sometimes they will use pine trees as well. So they do prefer like maples and oaks. They'll use those trees and they form their nest on the top of the branches. So not like you can see this is on top of the fork, not between it. So they form them on top. They're only about the size of a large thimble. So they're very small nests. They're small birds, so they don't require very big nests. And they meticulously make these nests. Just like Kim was saying, the warblers, they'll use spider silk. They'll sometimes use pine resin in order to, to build these nests. And then what's really cool is they'll cover them with lichens or mosses in order to camouflage these nests. So it's very difficult to spot a hummingbird nest. And hummingbirds will lay their eggs inside of these nests and their eggs are very, very tiny. They weigh less than half of a gram and they are about the size of a Tic Tac. So very, very small eggs that they lay inside of these nests. Very beautiful, right? Okay. So we have one final bird nest before we're going to bring in a special guest for you guys. And this is a really common bird here, so we think it's a good one to talk about. You guys probably all know what that is. That's the American Robin. So this is a pretty big bird. They're one of the earliest nesters to come back e each spring, American Robins. And they actually make a pretty big nest. So their nest can be about six to eight inches wide, sometimes three to six inches high, and the eggs they lay are really distinctive. So people usually know what color a Robin's egg is. That's right, Robin's egg blue. So they lay these beautiful, distinctively colored eggs. Gorgeous. And, um, and these guys, the female, again, does most of the nest building. And she uses a lot of, as you can see, lots of twigs, lots of sticks. And actually, she uses something that we talked about a few episodes ago as the cement in her nest. She uses worm castings. And if you guys remember, that's worm poop. So worm castings hold her nest together and just beautiful. So that's our final nest. I'll give you one last look at this egg. And then we were thinking, well, we're talking a lot about nests. There's a lot of information. How can we spice up nature news? And we thought, why don't we add a little turmeric the chicken? So I'd like, like to introduce turmeric the chicken and Marisa Nelson, our assistant director. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Hey, okay. hi everybody. My name's Marisa. And this is turmeric, and she is my pet chicken. <clears throat> she lives in my backyard with a flock, which means she's got some other chicken friends. So she currently lives with five female chickens. Does anyone know what a female chicken is called? That's right, called a hen. I'll bring her up close. You could take a look at her pretty face. So the females are called hens, and she also lives with a rooster. And only the females lay eggs. Um, this chicken is called a buff Brahma, that's the breed she is. And she's about three years old right now. And there's many different kinds of breeds of chicken. So if you visit a farm or if you um, have friends that have chickens, you'll see they're all different colors and shapes and sizes. And that's because there's many different breeds. And because there's many different breeds, you'll see that um, they lay different colored eggs. So now my chickens all lay 
brown eggs, but many chickens lay green eggs, white eggs, pink eggs, blue eggs, all kinds of colors, so it's pretty neat. Um, I wanna tell you about what she loves to eat, but I'm gonna ask you to send in your chicken questions now, because it takes a few minutes for uh, questions to come through. But what we feed our chickens is of course chicken food, which is um, egg laying pellets. And that helps to support their diet because they're laying eggs a lot, they lose calcium and they need proper nutrients to be able to stay healthy while they lay their eggs. And one of the treats that she loves especially, oh, thank you. Can I just sneak this in? <laughs> I'll show you first. Um, for treats, they also get black oil sunflower seeds. And then this is meal, dried mealworms, which they go crazy for <laughs> mealworms. Um, they also love to eat any, she's flinging them all over the library. They love to eat food scraps. And one of their, uh, the best day for a chicken is when we let them out of their enclosure and they're running around their backyard, our backyard, and they eat bugs all day. They pick on different plants. They love to take dust baths, kind of like our chinchilla takes a dust bath. M many animals take dust baths. We've actually went llama walking once and we had llamas taking dirt baths. So it's pretty fun to watch an animal roll around in the dirt to get clean. She's going to town on the mealworms. <laughs> um, and they also like to bathe in the sun, which I can relate to. So they'll sprawl out on their side, stick their leg out, and it looks kind of funny. They, they actually look injured, but they're just taking in as much warmth as they can. Um, so that's a great day for a chicken when they're able to run around outside. We're keeping our chickens in probably till about May because just a couple of weeks ago, we had a hawk trying to hunt for them. And so once we get more coverage in the trees and more leaves grow in, they'll have more of a chance to hide from predators because there are lots of predators on Long Island that uh, do want to eat and catch chicken. So, um, so they are omnivores, which is important to know. I did mention they eat bugs. And that's something to think about when you're going to buy eggs at a store when they say, vegetarian fed chickens, that's actually not normal for the chicken. Chickens need protein and are not naturally omnivores. We have mealworms all <laughs> over the carpet now. <laughs> At least they're freeze dried and they're not moving around. Um, so what's the lifespan of a chicken? Any guesses from anybody? I said, she's already three years old. She's still laying eggs. And chickens can live, they say five to eight years maybe 10. There is a record of a few chickens living to 20 years, which is pretty long. Um, and that's important to know before you get any kind of pet, it's important to know how long an animal will live. And that's important because you need to be able to take care of it for its entire life um, lifespan. And in New York State, they won't sell any less than six chickens at a time. And that's because they want anyone who's buying chickens to be very serious and very committed to being able to care for chickens for their entire lives. So they are fun pets, and uh, we thought you would enjoy meeting a true egg layer. And um, I think that's all I have to say about we chickens. Yeah. yeah. We have one question about turmeric. All right. Um, from Helen, um, and she wants to know: Does turmeric stay in your backyard all year round? So I have we have a cage area, and in the it's two cages connected to each other, and in there is um, some coops for them to go inside of. And we, the coop is in my backyard. So when, when I open the cage, they run around. Sometimes because I live on side of the refuge, they run to this side mm -hmm. of the parking lot. And sometimes people will see them under the bird feeders, but otherwise they stay in my yard. And luckily they have never crossed the road. So that's important. <laughs> <laughs> Our geese are not, don't, don't follow the same rules. Sometimes they are in the road, but the, the chickens are pretty good. Awesome. Any other chicken questions? All right, I will take two more. Everyone say bye to her. <laughs> take a good look at her. She, she's very bye happy. This is her first time on Facebook Live. <laughs> well, I wanted to show you guys her feet. Um, Buff Brahma's, whoop, here we go. Get her wing. Have feathered feet, which make them especially fluffy and cute. So I don't know if you guys can see her feathery feet. But there's only a few chickens that have feathered feet. And I think, whoop, they're super cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we'll talk about some eggs. So we have some really 
we have a beautiful century old egg case here at the refuge. Definitely when we open back up, take a look, come, come to the nature center, take a look at that. Um, we have a, a huge collection of eggs, but we do wanna show you a couple different um, of some of our really unique ones. So all the different eggs are different sizes, different shapes, different colors. They're very unique. Part of what helps um, why part of the reason why they're unique is because we do have birds what we call that we call brood parasites and that means that these birds will actually lay their eggs in another bird's nest so that bird has to then care for them and raise them but the problem with this is those birds that lay their eggs the eggs are uh, or the young usually is more aggressive, will outcompete the other young, sometimes will push the other young out of the nest. So that bird that's raising them doesn't rear any of their own birds. Um, so this can be harmful, kind of like the house wrens deterring all of the eastern bluebirds. It could be very harmful to lots of different species. Cowbirds are a great example of this. Cowbirds will lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And a lot of the time they do this by mimicking the color, the size, and even what their mouth looks like on the inside. So the baby birds, when they open up their mouth, it's a signal to their mom. It's like a big giant target for their mom to feed them. These birds mimic those patterns inside of their mouth. So they have ways to trick the other birds into taking care of them. But birds have also developed, these birds that are prone to brood parasites have developed ways to defend against this. So some birds are really good at distinguishing the difference between one egg and another. So looking at the colors and the patterns, they can do that and tell the difference between one egg and another. Some of these birds are really aggressive at deterring other birds away. Some of them will make only a certain size opening to their nest. So that way only their species can come in and lay eggs, not any other larger birds. So they've adapted. So these are barn swallow eggs. You can get a look. They're very, very small eggs. Um, so we thought we'd show you a couple different ones, speckled types of eggs. So you saw the barn swallow nest made of mostly mud, right? We have um, an American castrel egg here. This egg is cracked, but you can see the beautiful color. Kim, do you know what happens when you tell an egg a joke? I'm not sure. It cracks up. <laughs> <laughs> That must sense. have been what happened to that, that egg, right? <laughs> what do you think this egg is? What do you guys at home think it is? An ostrich egg. This is an ostrich egg, right? A gigantic egg, an ostrich. A flightless bird, kind of unique, right? So this is a gigantic, very thick egg of an ostrich. Emus are another really large egg. They look kind of like an avocado, an emu egg. Um, but you can see a lot of these eggs are very different. This one's kind of similar shape to a chicken. Mr. Tony showed you guys this one, a red-tailed hawk, right? Similar to a chicken, but some are totally different. I think we have a really cool one like this. So some eggs are actually shaped different because of where they're, they're laid. So this egg is very kind of cone. <laughs> oh, we have a visitor. <laughs> Big chicken. <laughs> big chicken. I don't think that laid this egg. Maybe that big one, right? <laughs> so this egg is a very cylindrical egg. This egg is actually from a cliff dwelling bird. And the way that you can tell that, I don't know if I can take a notebook, might be easier. Nope, that one. That, not that one. <laughs> I'm gonna hold this open and show you. So when a cliff cliff de dwelling, geez, tongue twister, cliff dwelling bird lays their egg. They're sh often shaped like this because if it rolls, do you see it's not rolling off of the book? It actually rolls in a circle. Do you see that? Isn't that amazing? So Kim showed you that perfectly round egg of the, um, the, where is it? Ah! <laughs> the round egg of the sulcatas, right? This is a sulcata egg. I see people asking who that was in the background. That was our director, Mike. He, he's got a good sense of humor, right? So all different eggs are different shapes, different colors, different sizes. Definitely come and check out our Nature Center egg case when we're back open.
You can also make different egg, colored eggs, right? You can even use natural products to dye your eggs. So Kim is gonna actually send a link over so you can color eggs naturally. You can make your own eggs. Maybe you can mimic an egg of one of the animals that you saw today. And you can, you can do all sorts of different things. So I think Kim's gonna finish this up with a little, a little conservation, because that's important, right? Okay, so the one thing about springtime, and that's why we wanted to do birds' nests and eggs today, is that this is the time of year when all the animals are having babies. So there's nests, birds building nests in trees, and other animals building nests other places. And one animal we get a lot of calls about right now is the cottontail bunny. So the cottontail rabbit. And they actually make nests in kind of what you would consider to be bad places. So they'll often nest in open fields or in people's backyards. And um, so a lot of the time we'll find that when people are doing yard work at this time of year, if they're weed whacking or they're mowing their lawns, they discover these nests. And they're usually just shallow depressions filled with grass and leaves and covered back over. Um, so keep an eye out when you're doing your yard work for nests of other animals. If you're trimming your trees, make sure there aren't birds nests in there. So cottontail rabbits, like I said, they often nest in backyards. And one thing to do if you find them, one thing to keep in mind is that cottontail moms only visit their nests twice a day, in the morning at dawn and in the evening at dusk. So if you find a nest and you don't see mama bunny around anywhere, it doesn't mean that she's not there with her babies. She's watching you probably. And the reason why they only visit at dawn and dusk is so they don't attract predators to their nest because their nests, like I said, are pretty much out in the open. So if they were going running back and forth all day, hawks would see them, other raptors would see them, raccoons would see them. So um, that's one thing to keep in mind and you're always welcome to call us here if you have any wildlife questions at all. But keep an eye out for spring babies in your yard, in the road, and in the trees because they're here now. Um, I think we're gonna end it up now and we're gonna say if you guys have any questions at all for us, I'm gonna come up here, I'm gonna give you a close up of the, uh, oh, whoops, oh. <laughs> Oh, we have a visitor. Does anybody have any questions for um, this guy? <laughs> He's very vocal, I swear. So here we go. I'm going to show you guys the nests one more time. If we have any questions about wildlife, bunnies in your yard, birds in your trees, anything you're seeing, you're not sure what it is right now, we will do our best to help you. Um, and like I said, you're always welcome to call or email us if you have, you know, any questions about wildlife, if you want to send us photos of a bird in your yard or a nest, we always do our best to identify them for you. Um, I'm going to wait a moment because there's usually a little bit of a lag. Um, any questions about nests, birds, chimney swifts, hawks, bunnies? <laughs> Our director in his costume, Renee. <laughs> well, for now, I'm going to come back here. I want to say thank you all for watching so very much. We love that we can do this for you right now and that we can continue to provide education while we're closed. Um, and then we also want to mention that we are a nonprofit. Um, so if you really like what we're doing or you like coming to hike here, please feel free to visit our website. You can become a member. Um, or we also do adopt an animal. So if there's an animal here that you love, whether it's our great horned owl or our screech owl, um, you can always do an adopt an animal online and that'll get you a nice photo and a letter from them sent to your address. Um, so we are funded by donors like you, by people like you who love nature. Um, so please, Bear that in mind when you watch our videos um, that you really are what sustains us and keeps this place functioning. So um, thank you so much for watching and say goodbye to Renee and Marisa. Thank you so much, guys.